It's a bit of a challenge to try to shrink where we are in 2018 with spinal arthritis into uh, 20 minutes. So what I uh, decided to do is to just focus on what has changed in terms of classification and, and diagnosis of this condition. So case finding un and understanding the breadth of it within the population. So that's going to be my primary focus. If a few moments allow at the end, I'll speak a few words about treatment, but that is probably best left in depth to another conversation. These are my disclosures. So this is an older view of the collection of disease states that are within the spondyloarthritis realm, uh, with ankylosing spondylitis being a, a prototype, if you will, uh, but then a number of others, including psoriatic arthritis, uh, psoriasis, which is genetically linked, inflammatory bowel disease, which is genetically linked, uveitis, et cetera. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, this is how we used to view this arena. And I'm going to show you how we're changing that concept uh, over time. These are some of the key features. Inflammatory back pain, I'm going to come back to a slide which uh, articulates how we define, as rheumatologists, IBP. Uh, Oftentimes, asymmetric oligoarticular peripheral disease, often involving larger joints in the lower extremity. Enthesitis is a specific pathological domain uh, that is unique to the spondyloarthritis. It's wherever a tendon or ligament inserts into bone, uh, and there is an accumulation of lymphocytes, neutrophils in those areas often driven by cytokines such as IL interleukin-23 or TNF or interleukin-17, uh, and can be one of the most disabling features. And then dactylitis, which is a swelling of a whole digit. So these are uh, pathognomonic features of sp spondy conditions. When it comes to imaging, you'll notice that I'm focusing mostly on the sacroiliac joint. And you'll see that I de-emphasize the spine. We'll come to that uh, in more detail. Here we have x-ray and then MRI images. <coughs> Laboratory, really just three items, sed rate, CRP, and an HLA-B27 gene marker. That's it. We don't have other key biomarkers that tell us about whether a spondy is present. Uh, the, um, B27 I mentioned, and of the rheumatic diseases, the spondies are the most genetically driven, the most likely to have a family history. Infections are important uh, in the patient's background, either overt infections in the gut or skin, or alterations in the micro gut microbiome or the skin microbiome that drive uh, production of interleukin-23, which then in turn drives lymphocyte uh, activation. Uh, and then the uh, other concomitant features include psoriasis, Crohn's disease, and uveitis. Here's a classic example of a patient in late stage ankylosing spondylitis with diffuse spine, uh, vertebral bodies fused uh, uh, via calcification of the intervertebral ligaments. Enthesitis is demonstrated here adjacent to a joint where a joint capsule fiber is inserting into bone. Uh, and uh, in the case of the Achilles tendon insertion into heel, the heel, you see inflammation at the in insertion site and then adjacent bone, so representing both enthesitis and osteitis. And then to, on the left-hand side of this MRI imaging, uh, the arrow is pointing to synovitis in the ankle. There are a number of other features that go along with the uh, condition, uh, ranging, I've already mentioned, uveitis, uh, psoriasis, gut. IBD is overtly present in 5 to 8% of patients. But if you happen to live in Ghent, Belgium, and come into the clinic with evidence of a spondyloarthritis, you're guaranteed to have a colonoscopy. <laughs> and it will be found that, you, that 
uh, roughly 60% of patients will have microscopic evidence of inflammatory change in the gut. Wow. Osteoporosis is a prominent problem, and one of the main reasons for morbidity and mortality uh, is fractured necks. Uh, there can be uh, lung involvement, aortic root involvement, less often uh, amyloidosis, cauticolina syndrome, and spinal fracture I've already mentioned. Here is one pathophysiology slide, a cartoon uh, which accompanied, was an editorial that accompanied a key paper uh, from Jonathan Sherlock published in 2012 in which he injected uh, interleukin-23 and in little mini circles into uh, uh, transgenic mice that were prone to develop spinal arthritis, photomicrographed and found that the IL-23 would migrate to enthesial insertion sites and the aortic root, uh, interacting with resident T cells there uh, that were IL-23 receptor positive. Uh, and uh, the theory here is that some stimulation of the innate immune system, either by alterations in the gut microbiome or infections or HLA-B27 unfolded protein response, or biomechanical stress, thus more involvement of lower extremities, all leads to activation in a genetically predisposed individual. These resident T cells or Th17 cells then make IL-17, which drives inflammatory response and bone loss, and IL-22, which leads to osteoproliferation. Thus, the, the paradox that we see that we have both osteolysis particularly in peripheral joints, and osteoproliferation, especially in the spine. OK. Sacroiliac joint. This is the key area we're focused on. And it's, and it's often frustrating to us as rheumatologists to see the patient walk in with reports of three different lumbar MRI scans, but really no look at the SI joints at all. So here is a plain radiograph that clearly shows uh, articular narrowing and irregularity and periarticular sclerosis. This is the 1984 New York modified criteria for ankylosing spondylitis. There's some clinical features, but the requisite feature is having at least grade two changes in the sacroiliac joints on x-ray bilaterally, or unilaterally grade three or four. So already, if you will, the horse is out of the barn. Damage has occurred. And we'll learn this is a relatively later stage phenomenon to see these x-ray changes. But this was the technology that we, imaging technology available at the time. So this one is probably not too controversial. This is a very normal set of sacroiliac joints. Although, if you put a number of radiologists and rheumatologists together in a room, it turns out that there's very little concordance between how, how people read these, these plain x-rays. This one is often missed. Complete fusion of the SI joints, grade four. Uh, the report comes back. Uh, Pretty good looking hips, no fracture. <laughs> this one is tougher. So this is where you, you find the controversy. And this patient would actually not fulfill the modified New York criteria for AS. But they have some changes uh, adjacent to the sacroiliac joint. So you're getting to be suspicious on plain x-ray. So uh, here we have some where we need the clinical context. And this is why it's useful to call the radiologist and say, well, let me give you a little bit of clinical background here. You're sitting there in a dark room. You can't, just looking at these images, you don't have the clinical picture. So we have a normal um, SI joint on the left. And on the right, patient's right, we're a little uncertain about what to call this. So we then put in some clinical context. It's a woman, low back pain for 20 years, possibly fulfilling inflammatory back pain criteria, which I will come to in a moment. 
She's B27 negative. She hasn't responded to non-steroidals. She has no other spondyloarthritis features. So this patient more likely is going to be a mechanical back pain or fibro type of, a fibromyalgia type of patient. Male, 32 years old, shorter duration of, uh, but, but still uh, chronic low back pain, endorses inflammatory back pain uh, elements, B27 positive, good response to non steroidals, but still no other uh, SPA features. So nowadays, we would get an MRI scan. There's no alteration in this MRI scan that suggests to us an inflammatory process in the sacroiliac joints. But here we, we see uh, on STIR imaging, uh, the patient has bone edema on both sides uh, bilaterally. So this is, gives us a high suspicion for um, spondyloarthritis. And, in, and at this stage, we would call this non-radiographic axial spondyloarthritis, meaning their x-ray is considered normal relative to the New York modified criteria, but their MRI imaging and other clinical features are consistent with the spondyloarthritis. And this patient, we would proceed to treat with anti-TNF therapy. Or nowadays, uh, there's also interleukin-17 inhibitory therapy, such as secukinumab, that we would use. This is uh, the, the, the difficulty in making this uh, diagnosis uh, through imaging, lack of biomarkers, et cetera, has led to the phenomenon that there's often a delay in diagnosis. Uh, a decade ago, the average was about nine years delay, six years in males, and 10 to 12 years in females uh, before, between onset of symptoms and uh, making the actual diagnosis. And during that time, well, in those days, we didn't have as much therapy. Nowadays, we have good therapies to put these patients into relative remission and stay there. And so that's why we are more insistent on case discovery these days. So let's bring us into MRI. Here's a, a good example of an early uh, change. Arguably, this patient's going to have a completely normal looking x-ray. The spine. Problem. We see uh, in uh, this uh, inflammatory lesions uh, in the uh, vertebral bodies, uh, but the problem is we can also see this in osteoarthritis. And it's been suggested that in order to make a positive diagnosis based on spine imaging, you need to have at least 10 of these areas of light up in order to be confident about a diagnosis. And so that's why we get so darn focused on SI imaging, SI imaging. So this is a, a, a concept slide that suggests that there's a period of time when a patient is sitting on the left-hand side with back pain, uh, stiffness, disability, and um, is going to show up just with MRI changes. Uh, and then later on, they become uh, radiographically positive. That implies that this is a automatically definite course uh, of progression. But let's look at that. This is a um, observational cohort in Berlin where you're looking at um, what's happening over time. And yes, the majority of patients do ultimately progress to having sacroiliac joint changes on x-ray, but there is a substantial proportion that don't and probably never will. And most of these patients are female who tend to not progress radiographically uh, as males do, yet may still have a severe symptomatology. I'm getting there, David. Let us play this out a little bit further, and then uh, we'll get there. With the, with the he's uh, not anxious. Few few moments that I have. <laughs> so, um, this is a uh, an F, uh, This was one of the earlier efforts to bring us further forward in time from the 1984 criteria, the Amore criteria from Paris that um, 
collected a number of symptom, symptoms and signs that were characteristic of spondyloarthritis, still only had x-ray uh, at, uh, at that period of time, added in the HLA-B27. Uh, and so if you got a certain number of points, then you became likely to have a spondyloarthritis. This was soon followed by the ESSG criteria, so taking inflammatory back pain or uh, asymmetric uh, peripheral joint involvement plus a number of characteristic features as listed here, and that might give you a diagnosis. Here are the IBP uh, criteria that we are currently using, um, and they are age at onset of symptomatology less than 40 years of age, insidious onset of symptoms, improvement with exercise, no improvement with rest, and pain at night. So if you ask the patient the question, do you find yourself awakening at 2 in the morning, getting out of bed, waking up the dogs who leap off the bed with you, uh, your wife wakes up and is pissed at you, uh, and they look at you and go, how did you know? Uh, so the patient gets up, walks around. That's actually one of the most, one of the key uh, elements, as well as uh, the uh, no improvement with uh, rest or improvement with exercise. So the many of these are the, different than what you tend to expect from a osteoarthritic or mechanical back pain problem. So then we come forward to 2009. And we now have the axial spa criteria, two pathways to it. One is sacroiliitis on imaging. And imaging can be either x-ray or MRI scan. And the MRI scan is two cuts with obvious bone edema adjacent to the sacroiliac joint. Uh, and one of this list of characteristic spondyloarthritis features, including endorsement of inflammatory back pain criteria. The other pathway is coming in by having a positive HLA-B27 and at least two of these features. This is a little bit fuzzier. We call this the clinical pathway as opposed to the imaging pathway. And at the moment, both uh, the EMA in Europe and the FDA are leaning toward approval of drugs for, quote, non-radiographic axial spa. That means, uh, uh, meaning patients have to have either an abnormal MRI scan or an elevated CRP in order to uh, fulfill these criteria, some objective marker of inflammation. To, because the FDA, among others, is concerned about this flood of fibromyalgia or mechanical back pain patients seducing uh, rheumatologists that are trying to, to do well to prescribe uh, TNFs or IL-17 inhibitors. I'm not going to get into this, but just to say that this, uh, this, uh, this group uh, that uh, I'm part of, the spinal arthritis group, has also come up with a peripheral spa uh, criteria, but I guess we'll save that for another time. So we're focusing on, in this lecture on the left-hand side of this slide, the non-radiographic axial spa and AS. So here's a Venn diagram uh, that a colleague at OHSU, has, uh, Tool Diodar, has come up with. And on the left-hand side, we have the, the totality of axial spa with AS, or ankylosing spondylitis, being a por portion of that, but a big number of patients uh, in the non-radiographic category. And then scattered about through predominantly peripheral spa manifestations, psoriatic arthritis, reactive arthritis, the arthritis associated with inflammatory bowel disease, and this category we call undifferentiated. And there are clearly overlaps between these more axial and peripheral presentations. Prevalence. Current estimates of prevalence of spondees uh, in the United States are 2% of the population. Estimated prevalence of rheumatoid arthritis is 0.6 to 1% of the population. Yet if you go into a rheumatologist office, what is being seen? Rheumatoid arthritis, predominantly. Mm. 
we're not seeing the spondees. <coughs> so presumably, you were seeing them, or physiatrists are seeing them, or uh, primary care docs are seeing them, and, and they're not tumbling to the possibility that these represent immunologic inflammatory conditions. This is uh, data from an inhane survey which shows uh, that back pain is a common problem in the United States. Uh, overall prevalence of ankylosing spondylitis, 0.5%. Non-radiographic SPA included up to 1.4% of the population. And it becomes equigender between males and females once you include the non-radiographic population as opposed to the males being ankylosing spondylitis predominant. All right, getting to Dave's question, there's a process of putting together uh, uh, the um, uh, history and physical of the patient and a little bit of laboratory. And these are the, this is the likelihood ratio that the patient will ultimately be diagnosed with a spondyloarthritis condition. Uh, and some of the more prominent aspects include positive family history. For example, uveitis would be another example, E27 positivity, MRI, MRI positivity. So we put these together uh, in order to build our confidence that the uh, diagnosis is present. And when we compare the ankylosing spondylitis and non-radiographic populations, they're surprisingly similar on many of these elements. And when it comes to symptomatology, they're very similar. But the key difference uh, is in the female population where there tends to be less radiographic damage over time uh, and potentially poorer response to treatment. That's still uh, to be determined. I'm going to end with a, a couple of slides on uh, how we go about treating these patients. These are the ACR uh, criteria for treatment, and the key take-home message is that the predominant treatment modality is with biologic therapy, either TNF inhibitors or interleukin-17 inhibitors. Uh, we also uh, use uh, non-pharmacologic approaches, physical therapy, exercise, et cetera. Um, there are certain situations, say with a patient has concomitant uveitis or concomitant inflammatory bowel disease, where we uh, select monoclonal TNF inhibitor antibodies uh, as examples. Enthesitis ends up being a special case particularly resistant to even attempts at sulfasalazine or methotrexate therapy or non-steroidal therapy. And then this is the European approach, uh, a little bit simpler to look at. A trial of at least two non-steroidals for at least two weeks at therapeutic dose. And then if the patient has predominant axial disease, leapfrogging to a TNF inhibitor or an IL-17 inhibitor. Uh, and if they have some peripheral disease, then sulfasalazine might be considered. And then the last slide is this one, which is we now are working at, uh, with quantitation of disease activity. Uh, so we do uh, a combination of patient-reported outcome measures about spinal pain and function uh, along with our physical assessments uh, and come up with, there is a scoring system called the ASDAS, Disease Activity uh, Score. Uh, and what we're trying to do is get the patient into a state of low disease activity or remission and keeping them there, uh, balancing with what their preferences are in terms of treatment and also in relation to any risk associated with the treatments that we're using, such as infection, when we're using uh, biologic uh, agents. Biologics have revolutionized how we can approach these people and uh, have really changed our ability to um, treat them. So with that, I'll stop and open to questions. Dave. So Finally, he couldn't wait. You were very patient. 
But, well, we had a case, this one, I think you worked with Joe Conoco quite a bit with this process, <clears throat> so I think you educated both of us, but we had a few patients, which is an important diagnosis to make because we had generally worked with for a year, all sorts of non-operative care, et cetera, just didn't respond, and within a few weeks after starting this treatment, it was pretty dramatic. You said about 2% of all low back pain has this potential diagnosis, did I hear that correctly? No. So 2% of the general population will have a spondy diagnosis of some sort, either axial spinal arthritis uh, and about 1%, psoriatic arthritis, et cetera, et cetera. Back pain, uh, chronic back pain is present in about 20% of the U.S. population on a chronic basis. Uh, the, of those, approximately 1% will have, end up having an axial spa condition. Great talk. Um, you, you had two slides that s sort of showed the onset of diagnosis, onset and then diagnosis, and there was a difference between males and females with respect to their diagnoses, like females tend to be diagnosed later. Correct. And you had one slide to sort of explain that. Could you, is, it, is that pathophysiology, or is that more a result of sort two, of? Two things. One. We don't expect, we, we've grown up being taught that spondies are a male disease. So we don't suspect it. We, the first thing we think of in a female is fibromyalgia. So that's part of it. The other is lack of radiologic change, which, uh, so if you're not looking for MRI evidenced inflammation, then uh, you miss it. Whereas in males, you'll see some of the telltale signs radiologically earlier. So is it more to the patient or the doctor? Both. This is a really helpful talk. Yeah. What about palpation along the sacroiliac joint? How, how, how uh, frequent is that? Is would, would that give you a great clue? Uh, and how early can you detect it? And I wish I could endorse that. I really can't. It, it, it is so variable how patients will respond when you're palpating in that specific area. Yes, possibly they'll be painful, but it's also very possible that either with palpation or percussion, they, they, they will not be tender in that area. Yeah, Jeff, go. I have one more question. I think, if anything, questioning about stiffness and length of morning stiffness is, is a better clue. So, so there's been sort of this resurgence of interest in the SI joint amongst surgeons <laughs> with like mm -hmm. SI fusion devices, right? Really? And, yeah. <laughs> and so with oh, respect terrible. to the diagnosis as well as the treatment of this, of sacroiliitis specifically, so what, what people have been advocating is a number of different tests in your physical exam like thrust, compression, distraction, Faber's test for instance, and then in diagnostic injections. What are, your, what are your thoughts with respect to all of this? So I, I think diagnostic injections are very helpful in my experience and, and sometimes are, especially in a patient whose, whose only manifestation is sacroiliitis, that can be a useful approach to buy time before initiating a biologic treatment. The, um, I'm less comfortable or confident about the simple physical exam approaches. I'm much more dependent on MRI imaging. I'm, I think you're an imager, correct? Uh, yes. So, uh, I saw your head shaking every once in a while. When, yeah. No, I think it'd be a great study to take the SI joint fusions and find out what percent of those have sacroiliitis. <laughs> Rich. That's a really important point. So what makes the SI joint so predilected? What is it? Is it the surface area? It's a pretty large joint, actually. It's like a, or is it the amount of tendon attachments and this uh, triple joint, which is frequently so a double joint? Um, wh what is it? Jens, I wish I could give you an, an erudite answer, but I, I don't. And, uh, uh, but it is, it is the, the key for the, where we look. Okay. Now, I, I mean, I really like the fact that you emphasize uh, conventional imaging also. I mean, this is one thing that has been so overlooked aside from the psychological dimension. And yes, I still like the physical exam. And uh, as our fellows can tell you, uh, my patients have to be basically disrobed and uh, the hands, the feet have to be inspected. Um, let me add that I will endorse, uh, especially lower extremity Achilles insertion, plantar fascia insertion. 
patellar insertions for enthesitis um, and asymmetric lower, lower extremity involvement. Can I ask you a simpleton question again? So HLIB27, I've stopped ordering that routinely because of, quote, lack of uh, therapeutic consequence. Should I start ordering it more again? So there was a period of time, about a decade, when rheumatologists stopped ordering it as well for the same reason. But then the 2009 criteria came out. There's this whole new pathway with B27 plus a few extra features. So we've, we've started measuring it again uh, on a regular basis. Help me also in terms of ANA, RF. I sometimes order that because we have just literally, yeah, yeah. we're inundated with arthropathy yeah. patients. And I, yeah. I love those slides. And this is a whole new kind of a emerging world, obviously. But when should we order those kind of lab tests? So we, we typically, I will admit, order them along with just to be complete. Uh, and we're sometimes surprised if we see a high ANA. Uh, but it uh, it's, would be unusual. These are usually rheumatoid factor ne ANA negative patients. So you're mainly picking those up for ruling out uh, lupus element or, or rheumatoid arthritis element. Uh, it's not an exact science. And, uh, and the especially frustrating thing is for primary care docs, when they have a normal CRP, normal SED rate, no uh, immunologic serologies that are abnormal, they say, well, you must have fibro. And unfortunately, that's, uh, that's a problem. All right, so, yes, Daniel. Given the prevalence, given the prevalence in younger um, patients, younger than 40, presenting with back pain, would you advocate sort of routine lumbar, uh, routine lumbar imaging to include, you know, so fat that's suppress a, that's images? That's a great question. And, um, I thought you were going to ask about MRI, but the, uh, there was a study in the Netherlands where the radiologists complained because they were inundated with MRI requests for the sacroiliac joints. And so when you build in uh, asking a few key questions or even doing a B27 beforehand, it's a way of, at the gate, uh, screening some of those patients. The problem with getting x-ray is it's more likely going to be normal at that early stage. And so I can't come across as advocating routinely doing that. I think you have to combine a, a, a number of clinic, key clinical questions being positive. Yeah, no, I, what I mean is, is somebody younger than 40 would present with, for an MRI lumbar spine after physical therapy, not relief, you know, relieving back pain. You could include few coronal slices of fat suppressed detuated imaging that would include, you know, big field of view to yeah. include the sacroiliac joint. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But until then, uh, short. on plain x-rays, I still want the hip joints in there. I think all of us oh, yeah, yeah, will want that. Oh, yeah, that's routine. That's and uh, it would be nice to include SI joint. I'm not looking at you, but I'm looking at you as the leader to include a yeah. comment on the SI we'll, joint. We'll uh, discuss that. Yeah. And I'll, Thank you so much. Yeah.